Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to be with uh, all of you today to talk about the elementary and secondary schools emergency relief funding and, and the opportunities for uh, dance education. I'm going to be going through a lot of material, and a lot of information. So instead of you trying to figure out how do I find it, stop, where can I get it? Uh, it's all right here at this tiny URL, which is also being dropped in the chat, and I'll bring this back up again at the end of the session. What's important to understand is where this funding is coming from. And the, all of this funding that we're talking about today is coming from the various COVID relief packages. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the COVID relief packages, there's been a total of $5.3 trillion that has come out in the three COVID relief packages that have been brought uh, uh, about since last March. That includes $43,000 per household, and it exceeds the amount of money that it cost us to wage World War II, which was only $4 trillion over a four-year period. Uh, and because of this infusion of capital into the economy, uh, the economist, economists are now predicting that our economy is going to grow uh, at a, about a 6% pace uh, and will generate about 3 million new jobs. They're saying that this will be the best growth since the 1980s and actually is a quite popular package amongst both Democrats and Republicans. There's bipartisan support for the funding um, th that's been coming out and particularly the last round. But as it relates to uh, our topic today, what does it mean for education? And you can see here in the CARES Act, and I have them basically in the first one, which is in March, about $30.7 billion. The second one in December, that was $82 billion. And the one just uh, last month was $168 billion, the American Rescue Plan. $168 billion just for education over, you know, from, from the, the bill that was just signed by the president. And all total, it's $280.7 billion that's being injected into public education as a result of um, these uh, stimulus packages. And so for the state of New Jersey, I wanna focus on the one that was um, uh, released in December, just so you can understand how the breakdown works. 90% of the funds have to go to the school districts. 10% uh, of the funds are held by the state, but the state is then using those to create um, competitive grants that they are also then releasing to the districts. So districts just from the December package are getting $1.1 billion. Um, there's $75 million for learning acceleration, which every district is getting an amount for that. And then there's another $30 million to address mental health and social emotional uh, learning issues for students. So this is the breakdown of New Jersey's allocation. And when you look over the allocations over all three of the uh, stimulus packages, you can see that the total amount coming into New Jersey is $4.3 billion for K-12 education. $4.3 billion. Of that, $3.9 billion is going directly into school districts. That's an incredible amount of money that's being flooded into the education system. Um, and when you look at the ESSER II allocations for districts, so this is an example of what uh, the state put out to districts, uh, showing them, okay, here's your district allocation, here is your uh, learning acceleration grant, and here's $45,000 for every district for mental health services, social emotional learning. Um, so that's the way that they've allocated it out. Uh, and what's important to understand is that this is formula based on Title I funding. So the, the, the allocations that are going to the districts are based on their Title I formula. However, it's not governed by Title I regulations. And this is a really important point because uh, Title I regulations have very explicit uh, uses of funding, and the ESSER funds have a completely different set of guidelines. So I want to review with you how the ESSER funds can actually be used. And by the way, in that drive that I set up, 
there are documents from the State Department of Education, as well as the link to the department's website, where all the ESSER information is. But in that uh, Google Drive, I've also put uh, the district breakdown. So you can look up what your own district's uh, breakdown um, might be for the funding. So what's the guidance? So the first thing, first area of guidance is any activity authorized by ESEA of 1965. Today, we know it as ES. SA, the Every Student Succeeds Act, including Native uh, Hawaiian American Act, the Alaska Native Education Full Equity Support and Assistance Act, the Individuals with Disabilities Act, the Adult Education and Family Literacy Act, the Carl Perkins Career and Technical Education Act, and Subtitle B of Title VII of the McKinney Vento Homeless Assistant Act. Basically, this is citing every governing act related to public education in the United States. Um, so the uh, allowable use of funds under number one is basically anything that's already authorized in public education in the United States, you can use these funds for. So it's important to understand that's how broad this first one is. The second one is the coordination and preparedness and response efforts of local education agencies with state, local, tribal, and territorial health departments and other relevant agencies. Uh, and this is all to help uh, address the response to prevent, prepare, and respond to coronavirus. And so this particular guidance is to uh, make sure that districts have the resources necessary so that they can coordinate with others to prevent, prepare, and respond to uh, issues related to the coronavirus. Uh, one of the things that I want to mention, because as we're talking about this governance, you may be thinking about, well, we're coming out of this. Why do we need to worry about this particular element? right now. And the reason is that all of the funding can be used and be backdated to March of 2020. So even though the funds just came out for the America Rescue Plan last month, that those dollars can actually be used for expenditures that occurred starting on March 13th of 2020. So if you had incurred expenses in your coordination with other agencies, this is how you can utilize it. So it's important to recognize that it's not just from today forward, but it's actually from March 13th, 2020 forward that these funds can be used to provide principals and other school leaders with the resources necessary to address the needs of their individual schools. Pretty broad in general, giving principals a lot of latitude with how the funds can be utilized. Activities to address the unique needs of low income children or students um, with disabilities, English learners, racial and ethnic minorities, students experiencing homelessness, foster care youth, including how outreach and service delivery will meet their needs. Again, specifically making sure that attention is paid to uh, those students that may uh, be struggling the most, may have challenges with uh, access to certain uh, materials and, and information and resources to support their education to the development and implementation uh, procedures and systems to improve the preparedness and response ever, efforts of local education agencies. The ability for the agency to respond as condition, condition, conditions change. And we all know our districts have been responding every week. You know, you hear about a district that, okay, they're hybrid and now they're going remote or they're remote and now they're trying to go hybrid or they're hybrid and now they're now trying to go all in person. Uh, so support systems necessary to allow uh, the local education agencies as conditions on the ground change. Number six is training and professional development for staff and local education agency on sanitation, minimizing the spread of infectious disease. So making sure that uh, we can sanitize our classrooms and our buildings and uh, making sure our staff understands uh, what's necessary about spacing and how students need to move about buildings and, and flow patterns uh, that have been put in place as a result of this. All of that ties to number six. And number seven, it's supplies to sanitize, clean the facilities of a local education agency, including buildings operated by such agency, all buildings, but especially school buildings. Um, so this is for any of the, the materials and supplies necessary to help keep um, the, the, the classrooms clean, the school building clean uh, and operational in these conditions. 
planning for, coordinating, and implementing activities during long-term closures, including providing meals to eligible students, providing technology for online learning to all students, providing guidance for carrying out requirements under IDA, and ensuring other educational services can continue to provide cons provided consistent with all federal, state, and local requirements. We know in this environment how many of our students were getting their meals at school. And as a result of the pandemic, our schools had to come up with their own delivery systems to ensure that students that were depending on those meals were actually able to receive those meals. And the funding here in this bucket, uh, both going backwards and moving forwards is designed to address those issues, including technology. Uh, purchasing educational technology, software, uh, hardware, connectivity for students who are served by the school. Um, so this, is, this one is all about um, being able to use the funds for technology, for broadband, for hardware, for the tools uh, that you all have been using uh, in your own dance classes and figuring out ways to, um, to engage with students and subscriptions to new products that you haven't had to use before. All that is covered here under nine. Under 10, providing mental health services and supports. This includes addressing the social emotional learning needs of students. Uh, planning and implementing activities related to summer learning and supplemental after school programs, including providing classroom instruction or online learning during summer months and addressing the needs of low income students and other categories of students. So this is really about the summertime, summer learning opportunities and also uh, extended school day after school programs, whether it is you're going to come together and you're going to do a, a summer dance uh, camp for students. That could be covered uh, under this funding. You're doing an after school uh, dance initiative in coordination with some other partners. That could be covered under section 11 of uh, this funding. Uh, 12 is to really focuses on addressing the learning loss, um, including the, you know, among the different uh, categories of students, but it's also tied to not just learning loss in English and math. Um, there's been learning loss ac across all of content areas, including the arts, including dance. Uh, and you can measure that by the lack of time with students. You haven't had time with your students or the, the time that you ha usually have with your students has been significantly reduced. One of the things that would be important to do is to document it. How much time would you normally see your students over the course of a normal non-COVID year? And then how much time have you spent with them during this year? Well, the difference there is the amount of time that you that 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 has delayed learning for students. And you can make a case to go in and say, I would like to, to have uh, the use of funds for a camp so that we can bring students together so that we can accelerate their learning uh, in this particular art form because of the way that we've been impacted by the pandemic. Uh, 13 is school facility repairs and improvements to enable operation of schools to reduce the risk of virus transmission, exposure to environmental health hazards and to support student health needs. So this could be used for things like, we wanna do put out an outdoor stage because we wanna do all of our dance recitals outside. Uh, that would be covered in here. We need to make changes to our facilities in order to accommodate space, or we need to move our dance class from this room to another room because we need broader space so that we can appropriately socially distance, but that room needs to be appropriately outfitted so that we can do our classes in the right way. Uh, all the facility repairs and improvements as a result of COVID fall under this. So anything that you would imagine related to your dance programs could qualify for funding under this area. 14 is inspection, testing, maintenance, repair, replacement, upgrade projects to improve the indoor air quality in school facilities, including mechanical, non-mechanical, heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems, filtering, purification, and other air cleaning fans, control systems, and window or door repair or replacement. This one is all about you know, fresh air. This is all about ventilation. This is all about making sure that the air in the room where you are learning with your students um, is safe, is filtered, is clean. Uh, and so if you're in a space uh, that the indoor ventilation just doesn't have enough strength to it, um, they can use funds in, from area 14 here 
to buy you know, independent air filtration systems that they would put in your room. And, and that would be covered by this. I know a lot of schools that are using this for ventilation upgrades, upgrades to their ventilation systems, inputting um, bipolar ionization uh, devices that help kill uh, bacteria and virus, um, as well as upgrading filters in their system, upgrading their HEPA filters so that they can handle the, 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 the type of filter necessary to uh, filter out viruses. All that is covered under 14. And then last one is other activities that are necessary to maintain the operation and continuity of service in the local education agencies and continuing to employ existing staff of the local education agency. Um, this one is kind of like your, uh, if, if you have a job description and at the bottom of the job description and it says, and any responsibility is assigned by your superior. Right? That's kind of the catch-all bucket. Well, 15 is the catch-all. You know, any other activities necessary to maintain the operation and continuity of service of your school and continuing to employ existing staff. So this one is to make sure that existing staff are remaining on payroll while then at the same time trying to address other issues that are related to um, uh, the safe operation of the building as a result of COVID-19. Now, what's, what I want to talk a little bit about is how might these funds be used for dance education? Um, and so just a couple of things that, that I've pulled out here and some things that are in some guidance, again, in the documents that I put out for, um, you know, in the Google Drive for you, uh, there are some resources there uh, that you can use to support uh, your instruction. Uh, so the first area is supplies and materials. And in the area of supplies and materials, uh, this could be used for classroom furniture, uh, to support the, the distancing of few, your, your students and bins to, to put their personal belongings into, um, individual dance shoes for your students, uh, somatic materials like yoga mats, yoga blocks, your TheraBands, uh, items that are needed for each student are definitely covered uh, under area of three and five. Uh, we have PPE and cleaning supplies and sanitation. You know, that, are, that, that ties into our performers masks, uh, addressing airflow, headsets and amplifiers uh, for educators so that they're not yelling so students can hear them, uh, ear guards, a variety of things that could be used in that area. Facility considerations that we talked about, you know, things that would need to change uh, in the dance environment, uh, supplies and materials to make sure that it meets the instructional needs of the dance class um, that could be covered in this area. So facility considerations are covered under 13, 14, and 15, including what we talked about regarding ventilation in the room, getting a standalone air purifier that can be in the dance studio if if the normal ventilation system isn't handling it. Instructional support and additional faculty. This includes professional development for your teachers. This includes hiring additional teachers if necessary to make up for lost instructional time. And it also addresses um, strategies that you can use to address the social emotional le learning needs of student, which is why I have the number 10 highlighted because that's specifically addressing uh, the social emotional learning needs of students. Summer programs, as we've talked about, a lot of schools I'm hearing about are doing summer music programs, summer arts programs. Um, and I think that it's a, a great opportunity to consider, can you start your own summer dance program or can you, um, you know, do something in conjunction at a district where they may be already planning a summer music or a summer dance uh, camp. Uh, again, opportunity to engage more students in meaningful ways. And then planning, lots and lots of planning that has to go on uh, to support our programs, uh, particularly planning for how we come back into schools. And then other ideas uh, that you may have. And again, this was not meant to be uh, an exhaustive list. Uh, this is just to provide an idea starter uh, around things that you're thinking about as you come back into school. What are additional materials that you will need given the circumstances that are gonna be dictated by the school, given the fact that we're probably still gonna to have to wear masks. 
given the fact that we're still going to have to have some level of distancing, uh, how much of that remains to be seen, we're definitely not going to be sharing stuff. Um, so, you know, having materials, or at least we're not going to be sharing, you know, common things. So the ability to have common supplies, you know, on, on hand, particularly as it relates to your dance programs. Um, so there's guidance in the drive that I put together. One is our arts education guidance from Arts Ed New Jersey. And then NAFME, the music educators, they just released one yesterday that I threw in the toolkit uh, just to give you a reference of how the music educators are looking at it from their perspective. Again, maybe as an idea starter or an inspiration for how that may impact the way that you think about um, the needs for your program. But what this does provide us for is an opportunity to think differently. And that is uh, that the pandemic has created a real opportunity to think beyond just the traditional ways that we've done our programs. Uh, when we <laughs> talk about the artistic process and, and of, of uh, create, perform, respond, connect, you know, historically, if we've been spending a lot of time on perform, they create, uh, respond, and connect haven't gotten as much attention. Uh, and during the pandemic, those areas have actually kind of grown. They've come to the forefront as we've had to reimagine how we provide our instruction. What does that mean when our schools come back in into play? What have you learned about, you know, asynchronous learning in this environment that you can apply to your programs when you return to school. So that you can focus on just those things that you can really only do in a meaningful way when you're together, which is perform together, right? But then some of the other aspects of the work that normally may have done in, been done in class, you can actually have set up to be done asynchronously or utilize some of the new, new tools and resources that you've been using this year to incorporate that into your program. It's an opportunity to think differently that way. It's also an opportunity to think differently that if you had additional resources, how might you use those resources to really uh, strengthen your program, increase student participation in your program, uh, create new, unique, and different ways for students to really be engaged, and particularly how to allow your students to come back into schools to engage in a way where they feel safe and where they feel that they can express themselves. And that's something that is uniquely uh, inherent within the work that we do within the arts. So uh, a couple things to keep in mind uh, regarding this funding is uh, with the, the, the recent funding last March, 20% of the funds that are going to local school districts from the funding that was released just last month uh, is supposed to be reserved for uh, addressing um, learning loss and social emotional learning needs. And you, I, you hear me keeping that I keep hitting on the social emotional learning piece of this uh, because that is a place where we have a legitimate claim uh, for support. Uh, the way that we address social emotional learning needs uh, in our arts classes, particularly when we're doing it with, with intention. Um, and then the state set aside includes separate funds from what the, the districts get to address comprehensive after school programs and summer enrichment. So there's then additional funds from the state that may flow into the district that can be used in that way. Uh, and then other uh, funds dedicated to, to su surround students with support students, particularly those that are experiencing homelessness. So the purpose of the ESSER funds is for the safe you know, the safe uh, reopening of schools and to address the academic, social, emotional needs of students. That's really the underlying premise. So why should dance education receive any money? Well, dance education is an academic subject here in the state of New Jersey that may require specific resources like we talked about that ESSER funds are intended to support. So as a core subject as defined by our state constitution and our learning standards, dance qualifies in that way. Um, and that students may need additional support to accelerate their learning after long periods without in-person uh, music or dance or after-school summer learning programs that may be necessary. And dance education can support the social emotional learning needs and create a welcoming school environment where our students are eager to engage and able to express themselves. So how do you get access to the funding? Well, the process is going to vary from from district to district. Uh, and, but the people 
who you need to know that can make a difference are your other arts colleagues in your district, your building principal, uh, your music or fine arts administrator, uh, your district's federal music programs manager. The district usually has somebody that manages federal programs so that they will be the ones that are actually managing the process. But certainly start with your supervisor, but your building principal, art supervisor, superintendent, business administrator are all people that will play a part in this. And your ask is that the students in our dance classes have needs that can be met through ESSER funding and that you wanna know how you can participate in the planning process for the allocation of these funds. Just a simple ask. We wanna be part of the solution. How might we be able to be involved? And so, but you need to be prepared uh, with specific requests. So you know, whether it's bringing back you know, a, a teaching position, summer learning programs, uh, additional materials and supplies, uh, along with the estimated cost, the rationale behind the need, how is it COVID related and why is it important? We just talked about learning loss or you know, the missed opportunities over the years and how you need the opportunity to make up for that. Or the fact that students now need these materials because in a COVID environment, uh, health and safety requires that they have their own uh, materials and supplies to participate. Uh, the amount of money on the table is really significant, particularly in, in some districts that have you know, higher Title I allocations than others, the, the amount of money going into some of those districts is huge. We're talking hundreds of millions of dollars in some districts. Uh, so you don't need to necessarily be modest in your request, uh, but you wanna be thoughtful about it and recognize that you may not get everything, you may not get anything, you may get some things, but it's still more than would be possible under normal circumstances where all we're used to hearing is, we don't have money for that. We don't have money for that. We don't have money for that. This year, many districts have money for that. And, but if you don't ask for it, if you don't raise your hand, if you don't come forward, they'll never know, your district will never know that you had needs that could be met with these funding. Um, and it's important to understand that other category again, is set there to employ existing or hiring new district and school staff. So that, you know, that, that 15th bullet is about maintaining staff. So if you hear of, of, of districts, maybe they're cutting their dance teacher, or they're talking about it, or we no longer have a need because of declining interest, you know, first of all, say money is there to keep faculty in place and you can't plan based on this current year. You know, you gotta give us a year to bring students back. You gotta give, everyone a year to have students re-engage in the process. Now, an important point is that any district that receives these funds, which is every district in the state and every district in the country, I don't know anyone that's gonna say, no, I'm not gonna take those funds. Uh, they must uh, within 30 days make publicly available the plan for the safe return to in-person in instruction and continuity of services, including how those funds are gonna be used. So they've got, so the district has to say, how the funds are gonna be used and make that public. But more important than that, before they develop their plan, the public has to be allowed to provide comment and input on the plan for how those funds are being utilized. So there's a public engagement piece of this well, as well, uh, where students and parents can engage in, and weigh in on how some of these funds could be utilized to support their programs. So uh, what you can do now, uh, first thing is to review the information for your district, get an understanding of the money that's been made available to your district in the different pots that we've talked about. And re remember, social emotional learning lives with inside the mental health area, and that's a pot that you can look at as well. Uh, and for, you know, learning loss, extended learning, that's after school programs, that's summer programs, those are programs related to you as well, because learning loss does not just apply to language arts, literacy, and math. Um, Take information to your supervisor and school administrators to share. I'm sure they're aware of it, but you know, say, hey, I understand that there's some funding available. We may have some ways that those funds could be used to support the, the dance program. Uh, and then develop a plan you know, based on initial indications that they're interested in hearing uh, what you may have to say about how those funds could be used to support your program. Develop a plan. What do you need it for? How many? What's the, how much does it cost? How is that gonna serve the needs of students? Why do you need it now because of COVID? And then 
use this as an opportunity to create more dance learning opportunities for students. At the end of the day, this is all about how we serve our students. How do we get more kids involved in our arts programs? How do we get more students involved in our dance programs? And this is an opportunity, again, to think creatively on ways to do that uh, with some potential funding available to help support in that process. So as I mentioned, in the Google Drive is all the information at this uh, link. You can go there, this presentation is there, uh, some state and federal uh, information, uh, federal information breaking down each of the funding elements and the guidance that they are providing, uh, state information from the state of New Jersey, including the district allocations, uh, and sample guidelines that we've put out and others have put out uh, that may serve as an inspiration to you as you think about how these funds can uh, serve your dance program. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you all may have uh, with some of the time that we have remaining. Okay. Oh, someone's switching. I'm looking at the uh, chat for us. Um, I have a question. Can you guys hear me okay? Hi, Melissa. Hi, Bob. How are you? I'm well, and you? I'm well. Thank you for asking. Um, so I'm really interested in uh, proposing maybe a summer opportunity. And I was wondering in regards to proposing that to my district or my leaders, uh, would I be putting forth like a schedule and maybe cost of other teachers coming in to teach and it would be free of cost to the students in the district? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the whole, the whole idea is that you would put this together um, and it would be free of cost to the, to the district. The other way to look at this is in some of the conversations that I've been a part of at the state level as they're talking about summer learning opportunities. The one area where we've been effective is hammering the point home that we just can't go into remediation mode. We can't just be banging the kids over with remediation tests and drill and kill and all that other nonsense. That, that said, with a lot of the summer learning opportunities that they are creating, they are thinking about the fact of how do we make these more interesting, right? How, how do we make it more than just, you know, we're, we're gonna do learning acceleration in, um, you know, in tested subject areas. And this is where you get, hey, we'll, we could put on, you know, a dance class, you know, once a day, every day during camp when they're there is one of the breaks, a transitionary period. So it doesn't necessarily have to be, we're going to do a standalone dance camp, although that would be great to do if you could do it and if there were the student interest. But you could also say, how can we inject dance into the process of summer learning for our students to give them a break and to engage them in a meaningful way? So it's not, don't, so you can think really creatively about you know, can I support something you're already planning? Can you include dance as a part of that? Um, or would you be open to us creating, you know, a two hour or three hour a day dance class that happens in the afternoon or dance camp that happens in the afternoon, open to all students in the district regarding, regardless of grade level? Bob, I have a follow-up question. Thank you, Bob. Yep, you're welcome. In that proposal, do you recommend that that you specifically reference, like for example, that would fall under num number eleven of the criteria that you shared? So, would you like? Is it smart to specifically say this meets, you know, criteria number eleven? Oh, it's very yes. Down here. Yes, absolutely. I th I think that you know that way because we've seen in some other in other communities, not so much here in New Jersey, but I've heard from colleagues in other states where they've. I went to my superintendent and they said, we're not allowed to use the funds for that, right? You know, it's just kind of a knee jerk reaction, particularly if they're in a title one mindset, you know, and they think that it's only for title one, you know, uh, uh, guidance, you know, it, it's really important to know to, for them to know that you've done your homework and that you understand what the guidelines are governing the funds. And as a result of that, you know, that these funds can be used to support this particular program. Now, yeah, that. They, that may not be a priority for them, or they may have said, you know what, we've already spent all of our money on ventilation, you know, and, and that's all we have money for, you know, that's going to be a judgment call. And, and that's certainly their right to make a priority around that. Uh, 
Um, but there are some places where there's, you know, they've already addressed it. They've already addressed the ventilation needs. And this is now new funds that are available for them um, that you would be able to make the case for. So, but being able to say, we're doing this and this ties directly to, you know, item number 10, we're addressing social emotional learning needs of our students. Or item number three, we're addressing safety and cleanliness in our classrooms. Um, just it really it really demonstrates to them that you're serious, that you've done your homework, and that you're you've you've prepared a methodical plan that that makes sense. Because ultimately, they're going to have to be able to justify it back to the state and federal government. So if you've already done that and said here's here's where it fits, then it, you've you've made their job easier. And I think the other point that I wanted to make sure that was um, out there is that, for example, dance floor cleaning and all of that, that those that may not be um, in the building just yet or in thinking of those things, um, funding for, I, we've been learning about sprayers, for example, that seem to work super fast in between classes that you just spray. It's, uh, they're called fog cleaners or something to that effect. But, you know, there's, there's items out there that I think now for the dance educators that may not be in the building that are thinking about that transition between classes, that there are things that are that can work fast and there's even ones that are smaller so um, um i've learned of another a dance educator that she bought the big one for herself to spray on the dance floor and then um from there she had uh bought small ones for the students to use as she was using the big ones for the bars or you know whatever else they were touching so it's logistics like that that um you know i think get that to know that that can be covered under, underneath this big purposes like that Yes, absolutely. The, the one thing that I would add to that is um, maybe a little caveat around, um, you know, some of the information that's been coming out now from the CDC regarding, you know, how crazy we've all got been wiping everything down and yeah, maybe we really don't need to do that so much. Um, so I think that uh, you want to be you want to be thoughtful about how you target the dollars to things that are, um, you know, really necessary. And, and so ventilation, air cleaning, the, the aerosol spread is the thing that everyone's now coming to realize that's the way this thing is spread. The droplets, not so much. It's really the, the aerosols themselves. So um, I, would, I would lean more toward those things that create a safe environment and the masks and the other things that would help students um, and and ask for proper cleaning supplies for the room, but you know the 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 school should be uh, certainly providing that. I wouldn't necessarily go extra crazy on some of the fancier gadgets because they tend to be expensive, and you could probably do something really cool for your students, you know, with the same money in a in an educational format. It's kind of like the way everyone went crazy with the, the plexiglass barriers. I mean, back in the summer, we're like, no, don't spend money on plexiglass barriers. And then six months later, they come out going, yeah, we shouldn't have been spending money on plexiglass barriers. Bob, what's the timeline for this? I stepped away for a minute, so I don't, I don't know if you said it or not, but what's the timeline for applying and um, getting the money? So the, the districts themselves have to apply, I think the for round two, uh, the districts have to have their submit to the state by, I, I think, May 15th, but it's just to, you know, receive the funds. They're still figuring out how to spend the funds, and they actually have until September of 2024, uh, particularly for the largest tranche of funding, which is the American Rescue Plan funding that was just signed by the president. That group, which is the biggest pot, uh, they have until September 2024 to expend those funds. Um, so that those deadlines haven't even been released yet. If you go on the Department of Ed Education website here in New Jersey on there and the link that's in the, the chat, um, currently as of this date, if you go what, click on the web page, it'll have here's all the information for CARES 1, here's all the information for SR2, uh, American Rescue Plan coming soon, right? So that's how ahead of the game we are on it at this point in time. But we know it's coming. We know it's a lot of money. And we know our districts are looking for ways to allocate it and ways to use it. So um, the dance educators should be in line with everybody else. Now that you just said that date, Bob, I just wanted to ask. So if it's September 2024, they have to spend it by. So it's a possibility that you could even, let's say, if it does open up in 2021, 
you could potentially propose like a three-year project, like every summer kind of thing. I mean, you could think that big possibly. Potentially, yes. It okay. depends on how the district is thinking. You know, right. are they thinking out that long term? Um, and I think the other thing that's important is try to emphasize things that have a long term return on investment, not just a one off. And I don't look at a camp as a one off because I think a camp has a long term investment because you're investing in the education of the student. But there are a lot of a, a lot of things that will be coming out of the woodwork as one off programs, bolt on programs. Um, and what you want to be able to emphasize is how the investment that's being made in tools and materials for your class will have a return on investment over time. Um, so to the degree that, you know, investments that are being made into upgrading the facilities, well, that's, you know, that's not just a one year thing, right? That will be there and benefit students, you know, into the future. Things of that nature, I think, are helpful um, so that there's a, a, a sense of ongoing return and not just a one time expenditure and you know, the benefits are there for a moment and then gone. Other questions? Do you think, Bob, it would be smart to, for, like I'm saying educational technology and, you know, we were like, we put there like licensing and um, software programs for video editing and music editing and all those sorts of things. I personally don't think, you know, I think all of our, all the visual performing arts fields have been enhanced by this, although I know that, you know, it's been daunting, but I don't think now we have an option to steer away from any kind of virtual engagement. Um, there's, it's going to be there just as a, as a bonus, I feel. Um, so you, can we validly, you know, ask for things such as the video editing, music editing, or even like, like I would, like I had mentioned to you, like the Nearpod, you know, even that to have it licensed through the district where we can advocate for that through those proposals. Um, so that this way it's a continual learning and that we always have that support system now, now that we've discovered it. Absolutely. And I think the thing that, you know, you know, when you were talking about Nearpod, it kind of brought to mind, how might that be used again, when we talk about uh, synchronous and asynchronous learning, right? So what do we, what, are, what, how do we make the best use of the limited time that we have together with our students? And then what are the things that they can be doing in Nearpod asynchronous, you know, that will allow them to, you know, continue to learn and develop, but not necessarily take away valuable in-person time where you want to be working on skill development or you want to be rehearsing choreography or things of that nature. Um, and that's where I think, you know, the the idea of how, what have we learned in this process that's worked really well that we want to incorporate into our work as we move forward. And then make that, making that case to the administration about, you know, this will really allow us to, um, to, to, to be much more efficient in our use of time uh, and make the student experience that much more beneficial when we're together because we're not wasting time doing things together that we could very easily be doing asynchronously on their own time. And I just want to piggyback off of what Christina said. Uh, I was having a conversation on how the arts need a little more um, refined technology than maybe other classes do, such as if we're teaching dance, we need a, a wider camera angle so we can continue to back up. We do need microphones to kind of connect. So um, in terms of selling that as like efficiency, um, you would put that under as well, just because I feel like I get pushed back for, no, everyone gets the same blanket technology because this is what we use in the district. Whereas I find it makes it in our space, it's way more challenging because we don't have teachers in English who are backing away and towards and around the camera to satisfy the kids in the room and on at home. Yeah, I mean, that's something that always frustrates me sometimes with administrators where they try to take a one size fits all approach. Uh, and not recognize that, you know, look, we're not going to look at the amount of money that we spend on science classrooms, right? Nobody's saying, hey, the science kids have to go learn in the math classroom uh, that looks like the English classroom, looks like the social studies classroom, right? No, they got, they got these outfitted labs because it's different. And I think that that's the comparison that you need to make is that 
we're not just, it's, it's not just another class. We are a class, but the way that we have to reach our students, the way that we have to teach, you know, particularly in this kind of environment, we need a different set of tools than a normal classroom teacher would need. I need that, I need that camera that has the wide angle lens so that they can see me when I'm backing up and when we're working on choreography. Um, you know, I, we've seen the same thing, you know, on with music technology. I mean, you know, there's a lot of, of very discrete technology that's used in music uh, that's not used in, in any other area. And, you know, so I would, I would just make the case that, um, you know, we're not, it's not like we're another class. We're, you know, and we're not saying that we're more important, we're just different. You know, and because we're different, we need different tools than you would use in a regular class, just like you have different tools in your science labs. I have a little bit of a strange question. Oh, I like strange questions. <laughs> um, if a district doesn't have dance, to what capacity or if possible, could these funds be used in that district for dance they could be used they actually you know they could they could be used to enhance instruction we haven't had this opportunity for students we believe that there is a certain uh, portion of our student population that would benefit from us introducing this program so therefore we're bringing it we're going to hire a dance teacher or an itinerant dance teacher that's going to come in and begin working with our students um, you know, as they come back into school. So the ask is for a salaried position. It could be, or, you know, or maybe, maybe you start small and say, could we have a, you know, depending on the district, you know, if the district can hire a person and has the work amongst multiple schools to support them, um, you know, then great. But if they don't, you may just want to start small and we'd like to bring in a person part-time to do you know, to introduce dance to students. And here's why, and here's the rationale. Here's how we think it will benefit them. Um, you know, look, when, when students come in in September, uh, in, in a lot of places, they will have been out of school for at least 18 months. Um, and it's gonna be a very different experience. We're already hearing from uh, principals and superintendents about the trepidation in which students are coming back into school now. Like they're, they're, they're anxious or they're, they're happy to be back, but they're also anxious about it. You know, there's a certain amount of anxiety about, you know, wow, I haven't been around all these people before. I don't know what, I don't know how I feel about this. And for some students, it's in a brand new building. You know, I've never been in a big high school like this. I'm like, this is kind of overwhelming. You know, if you were, you know, at the end of your freshman year and you haven't been in school since middle school. So as we get into September, the whole idea of how we make students feel um, safe, um, how they, how we really are attuned to the transition that they're going to need. We can't just bring them in and go, okay, kids, it's 805, off goes the bell, you're running down the hallway trying to get to class, and then 50 minutes later, you're off to the next class. If we, if we put them on the, on the hamster wheel, at like a normal school year, kids are going to be flying off everywhere. And, and so I think that's where uh, one of the things that everyone's talking about is how do we, you know, how do we ease into this, you know, and, and, and what are the things that we do to allow students to express themselves, to um, provide them with an outlet, to provide them with a place where they feel safe to express themselves or uh, where they belong. I mean, that's, that's going to be a really big part of this as we come back into school. Um, and I don't think... I don't think that a lot of people fully recognize that yet, but as we get closer to reopening, that realization is going to, you know, settle in on people. Um, and the good news is that at the state level, with all the other state education associations, with school boards, with NJEA, with principals, uh, with the superintendents association, those leaders get it, you know, and they're the ones that are cautioning both the state legislature and folks at the Department of Education who are like learning loss, we have to test our students, we need to know because they're left behind. And it's just like, you know, they didn't lose anything. You know, what they lost was time. They didn't lose any learning, they lost some time. So let's pick up and carry on and move forward. 
but not dwell on the fact that we're just going to bang them over the head with remediation. And, and I think that's the good news is that all of the education forces in the state at this point in time are recognizing that and are pushing back against those that are a little slow on the uptake. But when, our, when we come back in the fall, this is going to be a priority for making our students feel safe and welcome and create an environment uh, where they do feel safe. Um, and I think that's where the arts are going to play a big part. And I think for places that don't have a dance program, this is an opportunity to, to introduce it and to give students an outlet, another creative way to ease them back into what is going to be a very uncomfortable situation in the fall. All right, I think we, wow, we, we, uh, we used our hour. We did. <laughs> I was wrong, Christina. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we had a lot of good questions, Bob. Yeah, Thank absolutely. You so Thank you, Bob. That was, that was such good information. Um, I'm gonna share this recording, I think on, I'll put it on YouTube and share it on Facebook and get it out there. Cause I know a lot of people want this information who weren't here and we'll share the links and everything. Um, that is a lot of money. <laughs> That 4.3 billion for the state. Yeah, that's crazy. So 4.3 billion for the state for K-12 education. That's a lot of money. Um, all right. Anything else anybody has to say or chime in? Oh, we have a couple announcements. I forgot. Go ahead. Just Maggie. a couple announcements. So in the chat, I'm going to put um, the September ready survey. If you can provide, if you haven't Ooh, already. Yes. Um, provide your dance education specific uh, responses there. And then also Dance New Jersey has an event coming up, Dance Disability Equity uh, with Dr. Jenny Seaham on sept uh, September. <laughs> no, it's April 28th from four to six. Um, and that's free for Dance New Jersey members. So feel free to spread the word to your, um, to Dance New Jersey about that. I think those were all the announcements for now. And thank you. Great. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Bob. Thanks everybody for coming. I appreciate you this. Yeah. Bye-bye.